Psalm 130, a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Good morning, everyone. Earlier this week, I, um, as things in America just uh, got worse and worse, I uh, sent a messages to a couple of friends that we have, American friends that we have living out there, just to say, um, from all that we see on the TV screens, um, we grieve uh, for your country and we're praying for you. Um, I said, I have no words. I really don't know what more to say other than um, we just grieve um, and don't understand it. And, and one of my friends uh, came back uh, and thanked, thanked me for my message and just said she was heartbroken absolutely heartbroken with what was happening around her and um and she said there's just three crises um going on all at the same time there's the pandemic itself and the impact that that has brought um then she cited trump and the impact that he's had on america the america that she loves uh, is just disappearing in fact uh, Lindsay and i um, had a conversation with another set of American good friends of ours as well and um, about this trying to understand from their point of view what was happening out there and um, they would normally be Republican uh, they would tip that side um, but they were just absolutely shattered and they lost all faith in the political system they had no idea what um, to do now they felt completely um, heartbroken and, and paralyzed and overwhelmed um and then i said the th my other friend th said the third thing which her heart was broken was was police violence um seen most recently in the murder of uh, george floyd um but repeated time and time again in all kinds of places and certainly not um overlooking the extraordinarily good policing that um goes on and I hope we've seen enough this week of some extraordinary um, gestures of solidarity by police officers, uh, both in America and also in this country as well. But um, we have seen some appalling, appalling things, some injustices by people who simply because they wear a uniform and carry a gun um, or feel authorised to do it, don't feel as though they can be uh, touched. And it's overwhelming. And I've frankly been overwhelmed this week I probably should have stayed off uh, social media more than I have but um, there you go you don't you're trying to find a way you're trying to get some perspectives to hear some voices um, trying to understand what is happening um, and it just seems to be a, a gathering darkness uh, that's descended um, those in power those in places of privilege fighting back um, just the extraordinary um, thing that Trump did when he um, cleared that uh, square and taking a Bible, the most sacred text to us in front of a church and using it in the way that he did. Um, and Christians, I guess, will be divided about this, but for me, it was just an appalling uh, collapse of violent power and domination um, trying to claim some kind of religious legitimacy to that and um, the, the scripture that came to mind at the time I don't know more of it but when you see the, the man of lawlessness standing in the, the sacred place uh, beware be careful um, this is not good um, and 
And so trying to navigate through all of this has been has been really tricky. One of the things, as I know most of you have learned since uh, coming and having the joy of pastoring a, a London church, a multicultural church, you know, a diverse church, is um, I've got a lot of learning to do. And I've learned about um, my whiteness and the privilege that has given me the things that I haven't had to face. But it's also taught me it's not straightforward, it's not simple uh, at all. But it certainly taught me that I need to listen more than I speak. I need to um, submit more than I assert. I need to understand because I don't understand. And the stories that I've heard um, from many of you in this congregation and others uh, just break break my heart. And I, I have no idea um, in many ways what to say. And there's a diversity of voices out there. I mean, somebody, a good friend of mine, posted uh, an African an American um, who had no time for Black Lives Matter, who saw it as a left wing conspiracy, who, um, as his five minute uh, rant went on, um, sounded more at home in a in a Trump rally than um, something that we might see in the countless uh, peaceful protests. Um, happen under the banner of Black Lives Matter. Um, and so there's all kinds of mixed messages. Um, so where does that leave us this, this morning with this psalm, Psalm 30? Psalm 30 is, at its simplest, a psalm of thanksgiving. It's a psalm uh, where the writer gives thanks. Their life had been um, not only turned upside down, but nearly snuffed out. Um, again, that language, that powerful language there is there, O oh Lord, uh, verse three, O oh Lord, you brought me up, up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Um, this is not just somebody who's having a bad hair day, somebody who's, um, somebody at work is annoying them a little bit and uh, they don't have a bit of, we don't diminish the scope of this they were in the realm of the dead they were down in the in the place um, in the pit um, and the Lord reached down and and brought them up and put them in a safe place in a strong place and turned there um, as it says at the end you turn my mourning into dancing you've taken off my sackcloth cloth and clothe me with joy so that my soul may praise you and not be silent and um I guess for a number of people at the moment, um, they feel like there is just death stalking our streets. But for many of you, that's always been the case. There's always been this sense of um, darkness and, and death and, and opposition. Um, and in some ways, I want to take issue that in my Bible, the, the psalm is headed Thanksgiving for recovery from grave illness. And um, I guess it says illness because you healed me. Um, but I'm not sure that's the whole story here because it also says you do not let my foes rejoice over me. It's said to be a psalm of David read at the dedication. You did not let my foes. Um, and so it seems that it's more than just I had a sickness um, that nearly killed me, uh, but you restored me. But there was, and foes in its simplest term, is there, there were those who sought um, to destroy my life. Uh, to oppress me um, and ultimately to destroy me and God rescued me from those things and brought rejoicing into into my life and um, and therefore in some ways it's it's about the God who intervenes when um, the vulnerable are attacked when um, those who seek to um, follow the ways of God um, are threatened where there are those who want to do harm to them and to destroy their life and the appalling images of George Floyd and the uh, just the disturbing expression on the police officer's face as he knelt on his neck knowing exactly what was happening um, and just the appalling um, sense of satisfaction that he had that kind of power over another human being and not just any human being this human being this black human being and and so this psalm becomes the cry of of 
all of those who feel threatened and oppressed, whether there are those who um, pursue you to do you harm, uh, to do violence to you, to drag you down, to shoal to the pit and... Um, And the psalmist says, cry out. I cried out to you not to be silent, not to take this silently, not to take this in some kind of perverse gesture of submission, but to cry out to God is the first thing. That this becomes an audible cry. Um, and I would say an audible cry in the public space. Let me take you on a little journey. Um, some of you will know I teach a course at Spurgeon's College, um, Jesus and the Synoptic Gospels is the course I teach. I've taught it for the last uh, two or three years and um, the Synoptic Gospels being Matthew, Mark and Luke, Synoptic because similar. And one of the lectures that we do is we look at the miracles, the place of miracles in, in the, those three Gospels. Uh, it's a big part of Jesus's ministry and uh, there's no getting away from it that people get healed, the dead get raised. Um, the blind receive their sight, the lame dance, and, and so on. Um, but one of the things that we try and stress in the lectures is to look more carefully at not just what happens, but to whom it happens to. And almost universally, um, when Jesus does a miracle, it is for somebody who is on the margins of society, a leper, a blind person, a beggar a woman, a Gentile. Um, and so there's something more than going, there's something more going on here than just Jesus as a solution to our health problems. These are acts of justice. These are prophetic statements about restoration and um, what God's kingdom is truly all about, the breaking down of barriers and the restoring of people to full participation in in the things of God um, and the great sadness so often when we talk about healing miracles and healing services in in our churches and I've got no problem with praying for people being healed but when it's only about the removal of a health issue um, we haven't fully embraced I don't think what um, the gospels teach us about the place of miracles in in the ministry of Jesus they aren't merely acts of to do with health and restoring health they're acts of justice and they're done in the public space they're done very publicly okay there's a there's one or two instances where they're done in private houses and and that's fine but the vast majority are done in the public space there is a restoring of somebody um, and a statement by the son of god that these people should fully participate in the things of God and in the community of God. And part of the reason, it's not the only reason, but part of the reason why they crucified him is because those in power said, how dare you tell us who should participate in the things of God and who shouldn't. And they resisted. These people are not worthy of this. They need to remain where they are. Um, and power corrupts and ultimate power ultimately corrupts. And when you get all of those together and... Um, so Jesus confronts um, those in power, religious power, political power. And through these acts, these prophetic acts in the public space, he speaks of healing and restoration uh, and inclusion in all the things of God. And so somehow we must find a way to stand with those and include and embrace any who do not feel that they are allowed to fully participate in the things of God. Um, Kate Coleman, Kate Coleman is a, a black Christian leader and she wrote an article um, just this week. There's numerous articles out there being written. Um, and she talked about, I'm mad and I want to stay mad. And she used mad at MAD as it make, make a difference. And she talked uh, very helpfully and creatively about how we might make a difference. Um, but I was struck in the article she quoted from Jim Wallace, the American Christian activist, um, and she quoted from him and he said this, he said, a gospel message that doesn't try to change the world only works for those who don't need the world to change. 
The gospel message that doesn't try to change the world only works for those who don't need the world to change. And we need to ask ourselves to what extent our gospel message only works for those in relative comfort and privilege. Um, and it doesn't give hope to those who don't have it. Um, one of the things that struck me in this psalm is in verse 6, As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved by your favour, O Lord. You have established me as a strong mountain. And then you hid your face and I was dismayed. There is this orientation, disorientation. While I was prosperous, my life was comfortable, everything was fine. And then you turned my world upside down. And we're feeling that. And some have never been in that place of prosperity. They've never been in that place of peace. They've never been in that quiet place. Um, their life has always been a struggle. Um, they've never been confident that they're not vulnerable and impregnable. This is a resurrection psalm. It's often used um, at Easter time. It's that somebody comes back to life from the place of death. Um, and Beekner, Frederick Beekner, American writer, and I've used this many times, uh, famously said that resurrection teaches us that the worst thing is never the last thing. The worst thing that can happen is never the last thing. There is always hope. There is always anger for a night, but peace for a lifetime, weeping through the darkness, but always the dawn, always the morning. Seamus Heaney, this cropped, cropped up on my Twitter feed, and with this I'll finish. Seamus Heaney, the, Amer uh, the Irish uh, poet, um, in a poem I, I haven't tracked it down, but he said this. History says don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed-for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed-for longed -for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. We trust that Jesus by his spirit is moving amongst us again and restoring to full participation in the things of God, those who feel forgotten and marginalized so that they can join with all of God's people. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy so that my soul may praise, may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forevermore. May the peace of God always be with you. Amen.